Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Campaign. I said I'm the co-founder and CEO of Clear Metal. Uh, professionally, my background comes from Google. I spent five years there, uh, largely on new product incubation in the GeoCommerce group, and then went back to school here at Stanford to get my MBA. Um, it was actually while at Stanford that I discovered the inefficiency in container shipping and then sought out to build a venture uh, we now operate. Um, the short story of the road into that is for a very long time I've been interested in efficiency, uh, a little obsessed with it, and similarly quite fascinated with uh, shipping and logistics. Uh, during the program here at Stanford, I went over actually to intern at one of the largest container shipping companies in Hong Kong. And it was there I discovered massive inefficiency that the whole industry faces around uh, uh, optimal asset allocation. So literally where they put their containers around the world and how often they move them unnecessarily, keep them in excess storage, or ship things across the world with boats that are underutilized. Um, all that amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars per shipping carrier, uh, an unnecessary spend, massive operational inefficiency, and of course, the reason we're here today is massive carbon emissions. In fact, uh, just about 3% of all global carbon emissions uh, are the result of the container shipping industry. Um, and so we'll speak more about, I think, the company and what we do as we go, but that's the high level intro. Great, thank you. I'm Luke Raymond, um, and I'm working on um, my PhD at Stanford in electrical engineering. My focus is on power supplies, and so you don't think of power supplies as being something exciting and new, um, and I've always wanted to do something exciting and new. Um, so I had a background in mechanical engineering originally, worked for a while in that sector, and I wanted to get into the energy space where mechanical and electrical sort of intertwine. Um, and so I ended up in power supplies. Now, um, when you think about a power supply, it's basically just taking one voltage and changing it into another voltage at the very basic level. Um, and you can do that efficiently if, if you are smart about it, and you can do it in a small size. And so our focus here at Stanford is basically um, making it small enough and efficient enough that you can enable technology that otherwise would be impossible without it. Um, and so that's where Vorpal sort of came into being through the help of the Tomcat Center. So my PhD research has been focused on developing a new type of high voltage power supply. So basically something that takes battery level voltages and takes it to multi kilovolts and, and can fit in the palm of your hand. So it's about it, um, 10 times smaller and lighter than um, sort of an equivalent, a commercially available product. And that opens up sort of exciting new possibilities in what you can do with a power supply. Um, and so um, there's a technology called pulse electric field pasteurization. You basically, if you have a liquid and there's bacteria in that liquid, if you put a really short pulse of high voltage through that liquid, you can actually open the cell walls of any bacteria in that liquid and the insides come out basically. And so it's a non-thermal way to pasteurize milk, water, and potentially other liquids. Um, it's a huge energy savings when you think about thermal pasteurization, raising the temperature of a liquid up to um, you know, 70 degrees centigrade and then cooling it back down. You don't have to do that anymore. And um, it's always been the barrier to entry for that technology has been the power supply. Um, they're too large and too costly to be competitive at a commercial scale um, with thermal pasteurization where the energy cost is basically nothing compared to the whole system. Um, and so we're looking small. Um, we're looking at emerging markets, places where spoilage is a big problem, where energy cost is an issue, where um, you have a lot of, um, you have environmental impact as well um, as some health and safety concerns. And so we're developing a small portable um, a pasteurization unit that can be powered by a battery or solar, for example, um, that can be put on small farms in the emerging market. Thank you, Christine. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of PastureMap. Uh, so I'm a Stanford native. I went to undergrad here uh, and uh, then went to Asia and worked at McKinsey and then in private equity at KKR for four years uh, in the operations team. So I'm kind of an operations and metrics nerd um, who came back for business school because uh, I have a lifelong struggle with food allergies and uh, have been a sustainable foodie all my life, buying stuff from you know, like the um, farmer's markets all around the peninsula. 
uh, and came back with the uh, specific bent of applying my operational skill set to small and medium farmers who are my passion because of the people who feed me food that like I don't break out in hives uh, at. So uh, over the past four years uh, at Stanford, I've interviewed in person oh, well over 1,300 farmers and ranchers around the world. And then because I don't come from a farming family, I went and interned uh, as a ranch hand and a farm hand on four different continents as well. Uh, and it's there that I uh, be really became attracted to the, uh, the, the issue of beef, right? Because it's such a hot button, controversial issue. Um, even people who are very well educated about the, the beef supply chain have wildly different opinions about what should happen uh, to that industry. And, but what I discovered with, at the, on the ranching side is that there are, what's not controversial is there are ranchers who are doing a really, really good job. Um, there are like probably 5% of the industry here in the US and a lot more in New Zealand and Australia are using sophisticated grazing management techniques to manage their cattle around pastures in a way that is soil friendly and carbon friendly. Um, and I, I know you guys were talking about COP21. It's starting to gain traction. It's like carbon farming is a thing where you manage the soil not just for yields, but you're also managing it for soil health and you're managing it to increase the bacteria that are in the soil, and you're also managing it to increase fertility, and that has the effect of the ecosystem getting kickstarted and actually sucking down carbon into the soil. Um, and the latest estimates, like Scientific American just posted that last, last week, is um, we could sequester by, you know, Wild estimates, like 70 to 80% of carbon emissions. More realistic estimates, probably like 10%. And grazing and rangelands are, are actually a huge part of that because a third of the land mass on Earth that is not submerged by water is grasslands. And so if we could help, um, if we can help ranchers in the US sequester more carbon by using more sophisticated grazing techniques, we can sequester something like one gigaton a year of of carbon, which is a billion tons, which is a CO2 equivalent. Um, and the kicker of that is that if you have good soil health, you can also increase the productivity of the land. And so the ranchers make more money because they grow more grass. And if you can have more cattle on grass, that's a, that's a huge sea change for the, the industry um, in terms of making more of the other 95% of cattle ranchers more uh, profitable and efficient. So that's why I founded Pasture Map. Uh, Pasture Map is you know, just inventory management software on, on mobile phones that helps ranchers keep track of where they're moving their cattle and tells them on a map where they, what their stocking densities are and when it's time to rotate their cattle and you know, where the, the grass has probably recovered well enough um, in, in carbon friendly grazing practices to try to um, spread more of these practices to the rest of the industry instead of just the top 5% that are um, very carbon focused. Great, thank you. So. You've heard just a very um, introductory <laughs> bit about each of their um, different ventures. So I'm going to start off just asking a question of each of you, although I think, Christine, you've effectively answered it, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So since today's event is about making an impact, and we just heard about the um, COP, from the COP21 panel about the need to reduce carbon emissions to achieve the goals of that international agreement, I want to start by asking each of the panelists a question about the impact of their innovation on uh, carbon emissions. So let me start with Adam. Um, you, you had mentioned this number that 3% of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the trucking or shipping industry, shipping industry. And um, the shipping industry itself has a stated goal of reducing that by about 20% by 2020. So if, um, if you're trying to achieve that target, how much of that could clear metal solution help realize if it were widely adopted by the shipping industry? Yeah, good question. Also provide a little bit more background on exactly what the problem is and what we do. I think I was light on that in the explanation. Um, so as I mentioned, the uh, shipping industry, their cooperation is moving containers and moving 90% of everything around the world, essentially. Um, what they struggle with is understanding exactly where to keep their assets, their vessels and their containers, and where and when to move them. They struggle uh, on this because, as I discovered when, when interning at this company, there's so much complexity and uncertainty around the shipment cycle how the market will move, how their own operations will perform, and how customers will behave. And because of that, they can't allocate their assets uh, optimally, as I mentioned. Um, because of that, they're often moving things around the world unnecessarily. Boats are underutilized, and every time a ship sails, it produces a lot of, a lot of carbon emissions. Not to mention, along the way inland, there are a lot of truck, rail movements, and this also uh, spills over to air freight. Oh, that's not what we're touching today. Um, 
what we're doing as a company is we're using technology a lot more sophisticated than the, than the industry has in their hands today to understand, to make sense of that complexity and, and uncertainty, to figure out exactly where and when they need what types of assets. And by doing that, we enable them to actually reduce the amount of unnecessary moves uh, and, and improve the efficiency of their assets so that they're producing less emissions. We do that through data science and artificial intelligence software as a SaaS product, and that's what we give them to give better insight. Um, to answer your question on what our technology impact could be, uh, as stated, so about 3% of world emissions uh, come from this industry. Uh, the goal has, uh, or the industry has a goal to reduce around 20%. Um, it, it's actually very hard for us to calculate. We've tried numerous ways. We were recently reading a paper that came out of the University of Liverpool explaining how about 20% of containers are moving around empty. And a large majority of that is due to natural global trade imbalance. You know, Asia makes more than uh, North America does, so at some point we have to ship containers back. Um, but about 20% of that movement could be reduced through optimization techniques similar to the ones that ClearMetal are doing. And so I'd say by those metrics, about a quarter of that goal uh, ClearMetal thinks we can actually help impact, uh, which is sizable on a global scale. Very sizable. That's great. Luke, milk production. Um, that also contributes quite a bit to global CO2 emissions. 2.7% um, is a number that I've seen. Uh, maybe you can clarify if that's not the number, but um, if you help reduce the spoilage that occurs, uh, what estimated savings can be realized in the CO2 sure. emissions? Yeah, so um, there, there are sort of two aspects mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. One is reduce the, the energy requirement for pasteurization. So if you were to compare it with a, a thermal system, the energy um, would be about a quarter of what a thermal system would use. But the sort of lower hanging fruit, well maybe, would be to prevent milk from spoiling. So somewhere between a quarter and half of milk in some emerging markets actually spoils before it can get to market. Um, due to temperature um, issues, transportation problems. Um, and so if you could um, put a unit on farms that are, that are affordable, if it's low cost enough, to where you can pasteurize the milk for transportation just to get it to a collection agent or you know collection location, for example. Um, even if you prevented half of the spoilage that's currently happening, that would be equivalent to about um, putting four times the current U.S. solar installation in terms of global emissions. So it's a it's a significant issue that we're facing with the the increase in dairy throughout the emerging market, but there are some solutions that are to be had. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Christine, uh, you, you described a, a nice uh, grassland management uh, program that fa is facilitated by Pasture Map. And, um, you know, a part of the savings will be in feed and water usage, but also in s carbon sequestration. And I think you'd mentioned one billion. Yeah, it's, tons. it's a crazy amount, right? So um, there are, but if you put it in context, there's 600 million acres of rangeland in just the United States alone. We have, we have a ton of grassland, and, and most of the, the land mass um, it, that is not in row crop production in the rest of the world is also that. So that's why there's such big savings. And um, so, so the recent papers out of Texas A&M, which is like home, like heartland range territory, right, are one gigaton a year for, for US uh, ranchers, if they could all like flip a switch and magically manage their grazing better. Um, and McKinsey studies have actually estimated that to be close to like 18 gigatons. So it's a, it's a wide range. And the reason why the range is so wide is because the, the power rests in the hands of these ranchers who often are just stocking cattle however their grandparents stocked it. And it's not their fault that they have never thought about carbon farming because we are all just learning about it now. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the scale of impact that we have will really depend on the rapidity to, um, of which like, technology gets adopted and these practices get adopted. And policy is also really important too, paying ranchers for sequestering carbon and for these grazing practices uh, is also a critical part of the conversation. And so the regulatory environment is, is also critical to achieving the impact that we want. Mm -hmm. So the three of you are all relatively early on in, in this venture. Um, and I, maybe, maybe you would have a different answer in the future, but I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, each the following question, or whoever wants to jump in first. So in launching your business, what was the most difficult obstacle you had to face 
And the flip side of that is what's the most rewarding part of what you are doing? Let's change up the order here. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll defer. <laughs> I'll Don't start with that. Okay. Um, so I think the, the trickiest part for us because we were thinking about emerging markets was where to start. Um, because there's not a lot of money out there for focusing on emerging markets, even though that's where a lot of environmental problems you know, are happening right now. Um, and so we, we chose to focus um, sort of more local at first. So um, it turns out that uh, there's a disease in the US dairy industry, industry that's very prevalent. Um, it's called Yoni's disease. It's equivalent to uh, Crohn's disease in humans. And what's happening is um, farmers, um, just pure economic considerations, are feeding um, what they call hospital milk to um, the calves. Uh, the calves are separated the first day from their mothers, and then um, after the milking, the, the milk that's not suitable for market is fed to the calves. And these farmers can't afford um, to have pasteurization systems installed. Even the smallest ones are $25,000, $30,000. Um, and so if you could even break into that market, offer an affordable option for them to, to pasteurize just the milk for, for the animals, um, you can have a significant, uh, it's like a 30, uh, $300 million market or something like that if you were to capture all of it. Of mm -hmm. course, that's not necessarily possible. But that's where we're focusing on potentially breaking into this market that we want to eventually take to um, have you know, more economic and environmental impact overseas. So are you getting good reception from yeah, potential so far. customers of this? So far we have. Um, and we've talked with some dairy dairies in the area to do sort of pilot studies and uh -huh. so far. Yeah. Do you want to mention the rewarding part or you're still, that's uh, de deferred? <laughs> well, um, I think that for me the rewarding part has um, been to be involved in developing a technology that can make a difference. Yeah. Christine, do you want to address yeah. this? Uh, I think the most challenging part is ignoring the pressures of Silicon Valley. Uh, in, it took me a while to own my voice as an entrepreneur that I care equally about the mission and the impact and the kinds of practices that I want to see in the industry and that we are about taking a position in wanting to see a certain kind of practice uh, gain traction instead of just saying what investors I, what I thought investors wanted to hear, which is, oh, we're just about making money and we're gonna sell to whatever ranchers do whatever, as long as they pay for pay us and the bigger rancher, the better. Um, so that, that was challenging. Um, and talking to investors and if anyone here is thinking of starting a company, um, you know, come talk to me about it. It's, it's hard, Silicon Valley is a really hard place to uh, say, hey, we're for profit, but we also have a very strong conviction about social impact. Uh, because when people hear social impact, they, they tend to write you off as like a nonprofit or, oh, you're not serious about making money. But no, we're very serious about making money. Um, and then the most rewarding part is getting out of Silicon Valley and talking to ranchers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're my favorite people. And my day is, is like way better when I get to talk to a customer because the, the kinds of customers that, that are using PasturMap are the ones who are going to change the world and we're just helping them. Stanford used to be a farm. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. Some ranching here. Uh, the hardest part, I think, for us, um, similar to both these questions, both these answers, is the adopt, getting the technology adopted. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually because the challenge is bridging Silicon Valley to a world container shipping that um, isn't in very in many ways like Silicon Valley. In fact, when I got invited to go intern over to the shipping company in Hong Kong, the way I got invited was the lead of this company said, I have never in my life heard of anyone from Silicon Valley or Stanford in, interested in shipping. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that's been a challenge for us is we bring this technology, extremely powerful tools like data science mm -hmm. and machine learning and all these things to this industry where they've had this problem, a multi-billion dollar problem for 30 years. And these kids who've never done anything in shipping are showing up and solving the problem by an order of 30 to 50% better. And so there's a lot of disbelief on how could you take the same problem that we've had and fix it with something like this when you don't even know our world. Um, and so despite very impressive results and tests, maybe it's just the nature of enterprise technology that we're all facing in adoption, but it is challenging to get it adopted and these cycle, the sales cycles are, are long naturally. I think when our team talks about that, what we really come away with is the, uh, the challenges produced by industries are 
fundamentally challenges that their core competency doesn't solve. So what I mean by that is in shipping, for example, their competency is hauling stuff across the world in big metal boats and ships, and they're very good at that. But what they're not very good at is using software or developing software or technology, and they're also not good at reducing emissions or, or providing sustainability. And so that's, I think, the real fundamental challenge is this problem that's been created by them is not easily solved by the core of what they do. And that's sort of why companies like ours can come into these industries and disrupt them in these kinds of ways. Have you hit the reward yet? The rewarding part? Yeah, I, mean, I think actually the same thing is rewarding. It's again, bridging from, yeah, it's the exact flip side. Mm -hmm. Bridging from Silicon Valley to this. Bringing these tools to enable these companies and people actually who have spent 30 years banging their heads against the wall or uh, you know, being mm -hmm. yelled at by their manager because they can't figure out <laughs> does uh, Shenzhen need 32 or 330 containers. Um, so that's been rewarding. And yeah. Great. So in a few minutes, we're going to take questions. If you have any, um, please enter them in Pigeonhole. We're going to be using the Pigeonhole platform. Um, so if you have questions, you can be entering them now, because I'm going to ask one more question of uh, the folks up here on the panel. So I'm also a faculty member at Stanford, so this is a question that's very much um, kind of important to those of us who, who teach and, and work at the university. But I'm curious what... Um, courses or activities at Stanford might have been most influential or beneficial for starting this venture? Sure, so I think our story through and through came from Stanford. Um, mm -hmm. It was at the business school the opportunity to go work in any country, industry, and company of your choosing, which led mm -hmm. to the container shipping in, uh, internship. Um, Class-wise, there was a school at the GSP called Startup Garage in which we incubated our idea and worked as a team. In the engineering school, there was a, a class called MSNE 273, Technology Venture Formation, where we were um, put in groups of four of cross-campus uh, student groups. And it was there that I met my co-founders and uh, sort of changed the idea that I come back with um, to this data science approach. And then, you know, not particularly a class, but uh, again, the uh, Tomcat Center for Sustainability was huge, and I'm not just saying that, but it allowed <laughs> us, the, the grant allowed us to really commercialize what we were doing and get it going. Um, and that was perfect timing sort of in the year and a nice jump start to actually you know, becoming the company that we now are. Mm -hmm. Good, glad to hear it. Yeah, I, I guess for me it's, it's a very similar story. Um, it started with Tomcat, sort of why we pushed the technology initially and, and that sort of gave um, a framework for what the technology, what sort of specs we wanted to hit and it was really helpful to have a grant um, that um, was organized a little bit different than sort of research grants. So there, there aren't as many limitations on what you can do in, in order to explore the limits, for example, of, of what's possible with the technology. Um, but then Startup Garage is sort of where um, the company uh, grew and, and formed into what it is sort of today. Um, that's where the co-founders got connected and um, that's where we sort of made you know, huge strides on sort of our business model and um, talking to customers. They have a, a huge stress on getting out there, um, getting your hands dirty, going to farms, for example, and, and learning what the needs of the customer actually are. I'll just uh, add Steve Blank's class, uh, Lean Launchpad, where the assignment for the quarter is to go talk to 100 customers around 10 key aspects of your business model. So I, we wouldn't have centered on the uh, needs that we did without that class. And it was like getting up at 4 a.m. to go to farmer's markets to help them unload trucks and talk to them. Um, and then the Tomcat Center was instrumental. Like we would not have done, been able to do the early testing and prototyping while I was in school without it. And then uh, also the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program for Environment and Resources. Um, for anyone who's an MBA in the audience or who wants to pursue some aspect of environment and resources, I strongly encourage you to get that MS because they're very supportive in what you want to do. So almost every class, including my capstone, um, in some facet, uh, allowed me to continue to work on the company while I was in school. You guys made it sound like we, I planted that question just so we could get compliments <laughs> about the Tomcat Center. Glad to hear it, but I, that wasn't the intent, but very, very pleased it was helpful. So, okay. Um, let me turn it over to some questions um, that I have here on Pigeonhole. So this looks like it's a question for Luke. Um, 
Apart from sterilization of water and milk, what are other potential applications of your technology? Because uh, supposedly if it's use, useful for one liquid, yeah, it could be um, so, for Right, so one application would be juices. Um, even though technically you don't need to pasteurize juice, um, there, everyone does now. Um, because there were some problems with Odwalla, you've all heard of probably, where um, there was at least one death and several sicknesses associated with E. coli um, maybe 10, 20 years ago now. And so people that weren't pasteurizing now just out of safety, everyone does. Um, and so that is another application where um, in the sort of, sort of same space where this technology can be brought to. Mm -hmm. I, I guess... I'm excited about the applications, but one other one is electrostatic precipitation. So this is one I'm excited about now, and I've been talking to Tomcat a little bit about, but um, you can use a, a very similar voltage levels to what we've developed to actually um, collect um, particle emissions from um, whether it be a coal power plant, diesel um, engines, stationary generators, for example, um, and you can, you can pull it out very efficiently um, and so that's another potential hmm. environmental application. A different fluid, a, a gas. Yeah, a it's gas. a different yeah, fluid. Very interesting. Exactly. Christine, uh, there's a lot of activity in the broad area. Oh, I'm, I'm messing up here by not. Here, now you guys can see it, right? Okay. There's a lot of activity in the broad area of ag tech that Pasture Map is part of. Do you envision a future where it will be integrated with other uh, Internet of Things and big data type solutions? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the actually a really good report just came out from Innovation Endeavors, which is Eric Schmidt's uh, venture fund yesterday, and they've been looking at uh, farming and ag tech for a while. And ag tech is like a hot space in Silicon Valley, although if you go talk to farmers, they are not that aware that ag tech is hot in Silicon Valley right now. Um, but the the report highlighted that in order to get to IoT and big data solutions, it's sort of like Silicon Valley is 10 years ahead and has jumped the gun with these amazing, like I've talked to every aerial imaging and satellite imaging provider in the valley and we're actually partnering with two of them, but like there's not a place to feed that data from the API to a platform where farmers look at data because farmers don't look at data. So, you know, there's, there's like sensors that you can plug into um, the ground and it'll tell you everything about the soil moisture, but then it's not plugged into their irrigation system because they jerry-rigged their irrigation system with like plastic pipe and whatever was around and stuff is held together with string. So, like, it, it doesn't... You have, then you have to invest in a smart irrigation system in order to use this sensor. And so there is a, a ground zero, like ground platform moving from pen and paper records to where do you actually consume your data and what key decisions do you make, kind of like basic home page. Uh, that's where the industry is. And so that's, that's the space that we play in, is like basic things that to get the farmer in the habit of looking at something every day, like looking at a map and then making some decisions about where you're gonna move your herd, and then pulling in different APIs uh, from hardware companies and other big data solutions is a year or two down the line. Okay, question now for Adam. Um, your solution seems like it would be applicable to more than just the ocean container uh, shipping industry, so do you plan to migrate to other great uh, sectors in the future? Uh, it's a great question, and I mean, the answer is yes, this technology applies very broadly mm -hmm. in logistics. Uh, asset allocation, proper asset allocation is no, um, it is certainly not unique to, to shipping. There is rail freight, there is trucking, uh, air freight, um, et cetera. And you can use intelligent technology like the, the one we've built in a broad range of these, uh, these parts of the broader logistics industry. Um, so yeah, it's a great question, and um, our eyes are looking there. We're starting in container shipping, uh, given the background and also uh, for other strategic reasons of where, where it could bleed to. Um, but it's a great question, and certainly yes. I'm going to follow up with another question that I think is interesting here for you, Adam. Um, we heard a lot about policy with the COP21, and you know, one has to work around policy or at least try to influence policy. So the question is, is the shipping industry uh, constrained by policy? Um, that might be preventing efficient movement or storage of containers? Hmm. Um, I'd say yes and no. So there are uh, some policies, especially around union, union labor at ports and terminals, uh, which is not directly where we, where we work, but it has some limitations. In terms of environmental impact, 
not so much. Um, I think, if anything, the policy is actually helping push in this direction. The benefit in international trade is the countries whose goods you're trying to import to govern the rules of, generally, I don't, I'm not a policy expert in shipping, um, but generally govern the rules of the boats that can dock at shore. And so it's the countries like the United States saying, if you want to pull a you know, 10,000 container vessel up to Long Beach and import to the United States, by this year you'll have to meet these certain metrics. And so policy is actually helping push the carriers and the executives there to up-level their, their sustainability practices. So I think it's a good thing. Um, This is an interesting question I'm sure you've been dealing with or thinking about dealing with investors. So the question is, what type of investors are showing interest in climate change related solutions and are they increasing? Of course, we all heard a lot about a decrease in a lot of these investments. So where are things, where do they stand right now? Probably good for you. Yeah. Uh, so we're just finishing up our seed round and uh, it's been very interesting talking to people who, uh, you can kind of tell in the first 30 seconds whether they actually care about the same things as you do. So I would say uh, um, there are some very good investors uh, in the impact investor umbrella. And the impact investor uh, world is very complicated. And there's lots of different impact investors and they all have their own mandates. Some of them are family offices and some of them have funds. Um, you have to ask who their LPs are. Um, but I, I would generally say the impact investor bucket um, is more interested in truly like climate smart solutions rather than um, your just venture back businesses who also happen to have this um, you know, green attached to it. And, and, and very interestingly, a lot of the foundations who traditionally fund uh, nonprofits are because of PRIs, which I just learned what PRIs are, but like the, the, so you can actually have foundations fund for profit businesses. Um, so there's, and a lot of them, um, the big ones are just exploring their first investments in for-profit businesses and how to uh, apply that kind of uh, impact-related governance to it. So it's a really interesting space and one to keep watching. I, just to follow on that, I, I think it's, it's kind of nice that I think naturally the incentives are aligned because investors want to invest in the biggest markets and the biggest opportunities. And I think it just so happens that the largest industries are the ones producing kind of the most, uh, the most emissions or issues, right? Uh, agriculture, food, logistics, trade, things like this. Um, and so we went through a seed round actually in Innovation Endeavors. Uh, Eric Schmidt's venture fund is one of our investors. And in addition to NEA, a big fund in the Valley, and uh, Skyview, a fund out of Beijing, we're all interested in this space simply due to its size. And when we speak about the opportunity, the reduction in carbon emissions is actually very closely aligned with the reduction in costs and improvement in operations for them. And so these things kind of seem to fit together. And when raising and talking about this, we didn't seem to run up into too many issues because of the you know, mix between huge, in, huge industry, huge problem, and huge opportunity altogether. Luke, do you want to add? Yeah, um, I would say I'm very new to the whole space because we're still, we're trying to leverage what we can um, from we're looking at government funding and we're looking um, at internal Stanford stuff because we're still here. Um, and so that's why it's Tomcat, for example, is very important to us. There's a, um, there's a pre-court um, program that we have a grant from to help develop some of this technology. Um, but in terms of, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the climate-based investing market, I guess, if you will, seems to be um, much less stable um, and more market dependent than some of, of the other um, industries. And what I mean by that, if, if times are good, people are really interested in investing climate-wise. If times are you know, not so good, I think a lot of that funding tends to, to go away first. Um, but that's just, that's more sort of my own personal investigation rather than personal experience with actual um, funding. <laughs> I actually found the opposite. Really? Uh, yeah, because as you all know, the tech industry is not doing that great right now. I'm like, are we in a bubble? Are we not in a bubble? So like in November when I started talking to investors, there were a lot of VCs interested. And then like they all suddenly got very Back Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went because, the, because of tech. So. I'm looking in the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> Look for deeper pockets. Right. I'm going to 
put up one more question back to the sort of Stanford-centric part of this. So um, I assume a student posed this question. So if students want a job with your company, what should they study to help your company meet its biggest challenges? And maybe, maybe one way to think about that is, you know, going forward, if you were to expand, where, where are the needs in terms of expertise for students to focus if they wanted to be part of your exciting adventure? My biased answer is uh, engineers, data scientists, and experts in machine learning and AI, uh, simply because we're a company you know, bringing that to solve this problem. Um, but generally speaking, I, I don't know if there's a particular area. I mean, um, I think general interest in the problem that we're solving is probably very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really want to work with us or any of us, I'm sure we'd welcome them reaching us. You'll be inundated after. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, I look for people who have built real stuff while mm -hmm. they're at Stanford or have sold real stuff. So you're either building or you're selling at my company. So you will either have coded and um, created something or have gone and like sold or worked on farms. Um, so I value that kind of applied experience a lot. Yeah, I would second that. Um, I think that something that's been a little bit of a struggle um, is recruiting people with hands-on experience. So. If you can get into a course, a lab-based course, for example, or a course that, that builds something, um, there are, in the electrical department and mechanical, I think that there are plenty of courses where you can actually get your hands dirty and build something. And you learn a lot through that process on how to visualize systems, how to, um, to think about what the best way to put a product together would be, um, and how the user would actually um, interact with it. So that's... Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Christine, Luke, and Adam.